Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, Fireset chat. I am Eloise Pajot. I am Deputy Attaché for Science and Technology at the French Embassy. And so I'm very excited to uh, moderate this Fireset chat today. This, serve, this Fireset chat is the second episode of the recurring series Scientific Collaborations Across Borders, organized by QBI and the Office for Science and Technology of the French Embassy. Uh, in the last episode, we welcome Neven Krogan, Director of QBI, and Marco Vignuzzi, Principal Investigator at the Department of Virology of Institut Pasteur in France. And we talk about their collaborative research and also about the importance of conducting international collaboration, uh, and especially in this period with the pandemic. Um, so if you would like to uh, see this uh, last episode, you can have access to it through uh, the link uh, below. Today, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome two great scientists. We have Melanie Ott of the Gladstone Institute at QBI in UCSF, and we have Melanie Amon from Institut Pasteur. So Melanie Ott and Melanie Amon, you are both working on epigenetics from two different places in the world, uh, one in France and one in the United States. And I'm sure it will be very interesting to learn more about your work, about epigenetics, and also uh, to have your feedback on your uh, experience across borders. But before we start, um, I want to welcome our viewers who are joining us live to not hesitate, hesitate to ask uh, your question in the comment section below. Uh, and I will be happy to relay your questions to our panelists at the end of the presentation uh, so that you can get involved in this conversation. So uh, before we dive deeper into epigenetics, uh, Melanie Ott and Melanie Amon, could you please tell us more about yourself, your work, and also uh, the relationship between Pasteur and QBI? Um, I think you are muted. Sorry. I will start, sorry, now with the uh, with sound. Um, thank you very much, Eloise, for moderating this and, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Melanie Ott. I'm um, the director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology. I'm also a senior vice president here. I'm also a professor at UCSF. We are um, right next to UCSF here in Mission Bay, and I'm a member of the um, QBI. Um, we at Gladstone, we have 30 plus years of experience in virology research. We have been through um, uh, many pandemics. We have been working on HIV, um, hepatitis C, um, um, Zika, and now SARS-CoV-2. And as such, we are a natural partner for, um, for the Pasteur Institute, which is um, working on pathogens. And so uh, collaboration is in our DNA. We have been, um, you know, we have been working with many colleagues at the Pasteur Institute, but, um, but uh, Melanie Hamon and, and, and myself, we have, um, you know, particular synergies in the, in, the, um, in the area of epigenetics, which is what we're talking about. And this goes beyond just having the same name. So I can uh, introduce myself. Uh, I am Melanie Amon. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I lead a junior group uh, at the Pasteur Institute. It is called a, a G5 group, which is uh, given five years, uh, kind of like a tenure track in the United States, and we get evaluated at the end of those five years. Uh, we started the lab in 2016, so we are at the end of our um, track. Uh, and we study epigenetic modifications induced by bacteria during infections. And this is a field of research that I started during my postdoctoral work and that I continued through being a permanent researcher and then a lab head. And uh, as Melanie said, we share many interests on the mechanisms by which pathogens modify host epigenetics. Thank you. So yeah, to, be, to have a better understanding of all that, can we start uh, with the definition of epigenetics and pathogens? Yeah, I will take a, a shot at that. Um, so, so we 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 all know about genetics. Uh, we know that our you know the information of our life is all encoded in genes, and specifically the sequence of genes. What epigenetics is is the layer of information that is a 
it's is 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 above the the gene. It's actually the layer of information um, that turns a gene on and off. Mm -hmm. um, this is um, very exciting because it is a, it is a reversible and very fast process, um, and it's something that we can manipulate um, either you know, by, you know, in the lab, or we can manipulate therapeutically. And actually, that's what's happening currently. There's epigenetic drugs that are um, used for cancer treatments. Um, but we also using this, for example, to, um, to generate stem cells for gen stem cell therapies. And it's also being used in, um, in, in generating immunotherapies. Now, pathogens also have an interest in, in, in epigenetics, um, where we have, um, you know, two scenarios, and one is shown here on the, on the, on the screen, where actually a, a, a pathogen is inserting itself into the, into the, into the genome of, uh, of the host and is modulating um, and is using the host epigenetic machinery um, as um, a control to turn itself on and off. But the second scenario uh, is the one where the pathogen is not directly the target of the epigenetic machinery, but is actually doing everything to manipulate the, um, the host epigenetic and the host uh, uh, genome expression uh, by turning certain genes that it doesn't like off and turning certain genes that it needs on. And that's really um, Melanie's um, expertise, and she can talk um, more about this, um, this second uh, scenario. So I can I can come back to the the definition of epigenetics. So at the at the layer of of this extra layer that is above uh, that is uh, on top of DNA, uh, there are multiple components, and this is what we study. Uh, so actually, uh, chromatin is composed of DNA and proteins around which the DNA is wrapped, and it's the three dimensional structure actually of the DNA that is responsible for uh, expressing or not expressing a gene. And the way the three-dimensional structure is regulated is through modifications on the, hist on the proteins that are attached to DNA. And so this is particularly what we study because upon a, a stimulation, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, and we'll get into that in a minute, a cell will respond and will incorporate changes in these proteins that are attached to the DNA and change the three-dimensional structure and thereby change expression of genes. And usually the cell does this to adapt its transcriptional response to the stimulus. So if it's starved, it's going to adapt to that starvation. If it's being infected, it's going to adapt to the infection status. Um, so that's for the, for the uh, chromatin, for the epigenetics. And so these modifications, uh, yes, are very dynamic. They can uh, respond to stimulus, but they also can last in time. And so we're also interested in, in that aspect because particularly modification, particular modifications can be uh, transmitted through cell division and therefore maybe can impose a memory of an infection or something like that. So here on the screen is actually, oh, it's gone. <laughs> I was going to explain. Uh, so for bacteria, uh, so Melanie works on viruses and I work on bacteria. And bacteria don't integrate their DNA in the same manner as viruses do. In fact, they live separately from cells and that's what differentiates them uh, mainly from viruses is that they can survive without a host cell. They have all of the necessary mechanisms they need within this blue rod that you see is written bacterium. And so bacterium interacts with the host cell in different ways. Some bacteria stay outside of the host cell and interact with the host cell, which is in black here. And the bacteria interact from the outside. So there are specific receptors on the cell that can interact with bacteria or it can interact with bacterial products. But some bacteria are able to enter inside of the cell, and some of them can stay within this membrane vacuole, and some of them can escape and live freely in the cytoplasm. But through all of these mechanisms, obviously the bacterium wants to make a favorable habitat for itself and doesn't want this transcriptional program of the cell, which is normally 
uh, guided to be antibacterial because obviously the cell is trying to fight the bacteria and the bacteria is trying to make the cell accept it. And so it's this tug of war that we're interested in studying and how that affects the transcriptional program. So for bacteria, they're not directly integrating their DNA. As for viruses, they are using indirect mechanisms, either uh, have proteins themselves that modify host proteins or are able to use host uh, machinery to change the epigenetic program. Yeah, so maybe I can jump in and, and tell you a little bit more about what viruses are doing now. Um, as Melanie has pointed out, um, they are fundamentally different creatures um, than bacteria in the way that they are absolutely dependent on the host. They are basically incomplete and they need to complement um, their, their necessary steps in their life cycle with, with help from the, from the host cell. Um, and so what we uh, what we study is um, um, sp specifically the um, the epigenetic when it comes to HIV infection. We also have if we can have that little video back from the beginning when we were uh, when we were speaking, um, we have um, HIV as um, a very interesting virus because it is one of the examples that that integrates its genome directly into the um, in, into our genome and that um, then it becomes basically a host gene um, with some differences but the epigenetic layer that is on there is um, is somehow similar but also unique for for HIV and that is what we are really interested in to see a, what is the epigenetic um, uh, control for HIV? And B, how we can selectively interfere with it therapeutically to manipulate the activity of the virus. So usually what you have is the active HIV, that is your first, um, your first little uh, scheme here. Um, you see that the DNA is the string, and then you see the, the little pearls, which are the little balls that are around it. This is the protein that, um, that uh, Melanie has, has, uh, has talked about. That is the chromatin structure. And that, this, these proteins can become modified. They, they, they get these little tiny appendixes added to it, and that decides whether this is silent, whether this is um, on or this is off. The thing in the middle here is actually the TAP protein together with the host factor, the super elongation complex. That is a viral protein that the virus itself dispatches to really make sure that the epigenetic and the transcriptional machinery is perfectly put in place for HIV to function optimally. So all this is for active HIV. So virus comes in, produces a lot of, um, of gene products, and then makes a lot more viruses. And that's 99% of all the viruses that are coming in. But a very small, small, small number um, is coming into the genome and become, becomes dormant. That is the lent, latent HIV here, where you see that uh, the TAT is not there, um, the the um, and the locus is somehow occupied, but it's not active. Um, it is dormant. But you see between the different, the, 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 between active and latent, there is two arrows going back and forth. So the, the, the problem with the latent virus is, or the dormant virus is, that it can go back into the active virus very easily. And that is the problem that we're currently facing in patients, where we have um, basically all active HIV um, taken care of with the antiretrovirals, but we have the small fractions of latent HIV um, in remaining in, 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 in the body. Um, and, but, and the problem is that it, it is not active unless we take antiretroviral therapy off, and then it can revert back into the active state and can kindle, rekindle the infection. So this latent one in the middle is really the big problem that we currently have. And so it's, it's not surprising that we are looking into the epigenetic layer here of this provirus to make sure that it is not any more reactivatable but we want to push it basically into a state of silenced HIV where the, um, the, um, the modifications and the, and, the, and the epigenetics are such that the virus cannot easily revert into the active state anymore. And it's basically um, sleeping forever in the genome um, without the risk of, um, um, of reactivation, which means that patients can stop taking their antiretrovirals and they have very little chance that the virus will come back. Also, it's still in some, in some cells. And what you see in the bottom here is really the, all the different layers of, um, 
of regulation. It is not just one one thing. It's a it's a lot of different. It's like an orchestra of um, of different modifications that are affecting the chromatin, which is the histone. It's also affecting actually the the the, the, the enzyme that is driving the, the the replication, which is the polymerase. And it's a, it is also modifying the, the 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 viral players like the tut protein itself. So the epigenetics are really um, working at many different levels. Um, it is a very fine-tuned system, and by interfering with it or throwing a wrench into it, you can sort of block that fine-tuned orchestra and sort of freeze it in one state. And that's what we are trying to do by, by, by preventing it from going back and forth into between the active and the dormant stage and really pushing it into a, into a graveyard of, 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 of sleeping HIV that will not come back. So if I can just add on that, the, the, the um, machinery that Melanie just explained uh, is used by the viruses, but also during a bacterial infection is important to control gene expression either uh, to antibacterial genes or for genes that are required that the bacteria uses for infection. And therefore the mechanisms that are being used during both are similar. So here I just have it uh, very schematically grossly shown as chromatin and histone modifications. But if we zoom in, we would see the same thing as what Melanie was showing, the DNA with the histones and the modifications. And therefore, since the mechanisms are the same, then we can have this discussion, even though the infecting pathogen is different, because at the molecular level, we're looking at the same things. Yeah, very interesting. So what I understand is that you're both working on a very similar mechanism, even even though you're working on two different pathogens. So you're working, Melanie Ott, on a, a virus and Melanie Hamel on the uh, bacteria. Um, but so there is a lot of similarities. And so that's why I assume you're working together. Could you please tell us more about how everything uh, started? Yes, I think um, it is um, it is really important. I think I'm really delighted to work with Melanie uh, on this um, on this common mechanism of epigenetics. Although she's working on bacteria and I'm working on viruses, traditionally this would not happen. We would be sitting in two different camps or in two different silos. The you know the bacteriologists would do their thing, the virologists would do their thing, and even the HIV virologists would do different things than the SARS-CoV-2 virologists. So I think um, this um, thinking in silos is really one thing that um, that we want to get rid of, and um, and that is actually um, practiced um, by the collaboration that we that we establishing with the um, with the Pasteur Institute and, and and enjoying to have. The 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 point is really here that that pathogens are going after the same biological processes in our mm -hmm. bodies. Um, in this case, epigenetics, a very intricate and and complicated and orchestrated um, um, biology. Uh, but it is something that is very common because uh, because a the pathogen is sort of tweaking at similar you know similar levels in the um, in this machinery and that that makes it similar um, and that's what we can share we can share you know technologies we can share knowledge we can share um, you know data on this uh, and 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 that is inspiring between uh, between the two fields. Um, but we can also think about treatments, um, and these treatments um, can now span not only multiple viruses, potentially, they can also span, you know, between um, viruses um, and bacteria. And I think that is um, what is super exciting, um, you know, overcoming these silos, but also thinking about pan-pathogenic um, uh, therapies in the future. And so also coming back to, to bacteria, what's important these days is because there's such a big problem with uh, antibacterial resistance, antibiotic resistance, uh, which antibiotics are drugs that are directly acting and killing bacteria. And bacteria have found mechanisms to evade these killing mechanisms so that they can survive. And so it's really important these days to find new therapeutics that are not going to be directly 
targeted against the bacterium and there are similar problems for viruses because they can very quickly adapt as well. And so this, this way of thinking is a sort of a, a new way uh, of targeting what we call host-directed therapies. And so by, we think that by targeting the host and the host mechanisms that maybe we can sort of evade or, or uh, alleviate the resistance mechanisms that, that are being uh, developed. And so breaking these silos is really important because our, our field, in fact, even what we're doing within our lab is very much breaking the silos because it used to be that people would study the molecular biology of the host cell, looking at transcription and looking at all of those mechanisms, epigenetic mechanisms, but under very artificial stimulations. And we're using bacteria or viruses. So we have to have the knowledge of how the pathogens infect and also how the host cell responds. And so within our labs, we're already breaking the silos and then going further, interacting with people that are doing similar things. Yeah, we can get inspired by what they do and, and bring those things back. And we can also share model systems and so different cells that we might use that could be important for one or the other. And then ultimately, yes, the goal would be to find something that could be pan pathogen and that could um, could uh, work against many infections. And it could work potentially against future infections, because when we go um, when we go against not not with a specific antiviral for one specific virus or bacteria, I think we but more sort of the common biology that they all need or 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 target. I think we have a better chance to find also some treatments that might work in the future against a pathogen that we don't have yet all this detailed knowledge about, but we have to sort of act out of, you know, need of an immediate response. So I think that is um, that is really the, the advantage of that, you know, going across the different um, the different pathogens. And and as Melanie said, um, for the, for virals, antivirals, I think the big, big problem is, and we see this now with SARS-CoV-2 generating variants um, very rapidly, the, the point is that a pathogen can, can become resistant to a drug very fast um, because it replicates very fast and, and, and the, the replication machinery can make mistakes and that gives rise to mutations. And if they're beneficial, they will be taking over in the in the future. But very much like the Delta virus now has taken over because it is a, 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 a better, in some way a better virus. And so I think the, the key here is if, if we are, um, but if we are going against host factors, um, this is not happening because we cannot mutate around the drug, um, you know, in the same way like a pathogen can. So when we go for the with the classical antivirals or even bacteria, we have to often combine them and antibiotics. I think we often have to combine them in order to to um, to avoid this resistance development and to be very broad and and and, and ironclad basically in its in its suppression. But that is very expensive uh, because instead of one drug, you need actually three drugs for for an efficient regimen. And so the the hope is by turning this around and going against the host factor, we can find now potentially one drug that works against many pathogens and as I said at the beginning, also against pathogens that might might come up in the future um, if they have certain criteria or characteristics that we can predict makes them um, potentially sensitive to a, to a certain drug. Yeah, so as you said, it's very powerful to uh, break the silos and work together and share your work. Uh, I also want to point out point out that you are also breaking borders because you are working from France and from United States. Uh, so could you please tell us more about that? How important for you is it to collaborate across border and how feasible is that? I can uh, I can start with that. Um, so the obviously the collaborations that you have internationally are going to be different than the collaboration you have with the lab next door. Um, but uh, it's, it's important to, to do uh, cross um, nation, national uh, uh, collaborations because I think even just the culture of science is different in different culture, countries and, and how people do science. So it's always very, um, 
it, it's inspiring to see how other people do science, how other institutes work, uh, and then to bring back what could be useful for, for us. So I think that's, that, that's, that's uh, very uh, important. Of course, uh, it's not as easy as going knocking next door and saying, hey, can you help me with this and, and can we do this together? Um, but in a sense, it, it, it's more, um, you have to think about it more. And so it's, it's something that is more planned. Um, and uh, it needs organized in the sense that if you want to do experiments together, you need to send someone over. And so we tried doing this and uh, this was uh, complicated for, for monetary reasons because you need funding for the person to travel, to stay and to, to do these, uh, these experiments. Um, and also it's not that easy to travel with our pathogens, obviously. Um, but so it's more, uh, I think, a, a um, theoretical and discussing ideas and how to do things and protocols and um, things like that that are that are fruitful in a, in a, such a far uh, collaboration. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, I love to come to Paris, um, and I hope that the, that uh, that that you can come soon back here. Um, I mean, you are American, Melanie, so you probably don't have a problem, but, um, but uh, you know, all the travel restrictions currently are not really helpful, obviously, for an international collaboration. But if one thing, if it is one thing that I have learned uh, in that past 18 months during the pandemic is that we have now, we don't need to travel anymore um, to get uh, information across, to send data, to, um, to find ways around obstacles. Um, I think um, this this um, this broadcast here is a, is a really a living a living example of how far we have come in terms of making these interactions hopefully more fruitful and uh, engaging and, and and easy. So instead of me going into the plane and flying 12 hours to um, to Paris, I, I just get up and go into my office and turn on my computer and can um, and can have a very very interesting scientific discussion. Um, it's true. I think um, being uh, next door and having, you know, the immediate interaction with all the lab members and they, you know, interacting with each other is is priceless. But I would say um, this is a this is an amazing start. And I think, um, you know, more things hopefully will happen. And as Melanie said, we were very eager to exchange you know, people in our labs to to sort of also have an exchange of of expertise, and I think that is sort of the next step that hopefully, with uh, the pandemic receding now, um, is going to become more plausible for the future, uh, because that is really what 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 is a huge benefit also for our trainees is that uh, they're getting exposed to a different environment, they're getting exposed to a different way of thinking, um, they're going to seminars at the Pasteur that that people are giving, so they they see their exposed to other world-class, you know, institutions, how they're doing science, how they're thinking, and they're making important networking connections, which I think is, is something that is priceless and will, and will be, um, you know, there for them, um, you know, for the rest of their lives and will, will be, will be useful because um, if I have a problem or a question, I call up Melanie and hopefully they will, you know, find their co counterparts in the future so that they can call up whoever they need to call up for their, for their questions. So I think in terms of mentoring, in terms of stimulation, in terms of expertise, exchange of expertise, um, I think these are um, really important, um, important interactions and, um, and very, very cherished, I think, from both sides. Yeah, I agree. And also what you were telling me before is that uh, you want to continue that and to make it bigger and so that you were working on a consortium between uh, Pasteur and QBI on epigenetics and infectious disease. Um, so could you please tell us more about it and how this will look like? What do you want to uh, attend with that? So I think it's particularly important in fields where uh, there are not that many people working on the same subject. And so that's why we're so uh, close and, and complementary in that, is that there's not that many people doing what we do. So get, getting us together and discussing our common problems, our common projects is very fruitful. Um, and so I think that the Pasteur Institute and the QBI had seen 
that this interaction would be uh, very fruitful for many of the researchers in both institutes. And so this was initiated, I think, by the QBI, if I understand, if I remember correctly. And they actually invited all of us from Pasteur to come and to have a conference uh, in San Francisco, which was a great interaction, scientific interaction or personal interaction. We got to meet uh, everyone and we got to spend a, a lot of time together. Uh, and so I think this, is, this opens up the communication between the two. And so now I think um, what we're trying to do is to set up uh, a fund so that we can use money to actually do experiments and travel and uh, have more concrete projects and, and research um, projects. As I said, we would love to come to Paris next, um, but I, I think it's true. I think uh, once you bring uh, a group of uh, passionate scientists in a room, um, there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff happening. Um, and I think, um, you know, if the QBI has done uh, one thing, uh, it is really, um, you know, breaking down these silos, not only among different pathogens, but also among different scientists. So traditionally virologists or, you know, other, you know, mi microbiologists, they work in the lab, they cultivate the virus, they propagate, they analyze. But I think as you see, we, we be going deep into the biology of the, of, 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 of a cell. And so epigenetics, um, you know, you have experts in that field that come from other fields, as I said, from cancer potentially, or just from the basic biology or from the structure of the three-dimensional, you know, structure. So there's many aspects or from the pharmacology, how can we interfere? with it and bringing these all these expertises together um, and having people look at one one issue from from different sides I think is 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 really amazingly um, um, productive and um, and I think the 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 one thing that we have learned from the pandemic is that once we put our 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 focus on 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 a, on a pathogen that is causing a, a you know a worldwide threat to to everybody, um, I think uh, amazing things can happen very fast. And I, I think bringing these um, bringing all these different scientific expertises, but also the the breadth of the different pathogens together, is really the perfect recipe to um, to to achieve uh, hopefully to keep the momentum that we have currently from from the pandemic and to expand it to uh, to many other problems that we have in the pathogen world. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's also uh, what we came up with uh, during the first episode of the QBI Firestat chat, because we were saying that during the pandemic, uh, we managed to do in one year what usually takes many years, even 10 years. So uh, it's very powerful to collaborate like that. And that's a very amazing project. Um, so now uh, we have uh, many questions from the audience. So I suggest that we move to it. Um, so the first question is, are the bacterial epigenetic proteins that can affect directly the host cell epigenome? So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, there are bacteria that encode proteins that have direct enzymatic activity against the host cell epigenome. So one example is uh, Legionella pneumophila. It has a uh, protein that has a methyltransferase domain, an S -a set domain, and it has been shown to be secreted by the bacterium and to directly target histones of the host cells. So that's just one example, but there are many other bacteria that have these enzymatic proteins that can be uh, targeted to the host nucleus. And they're actually called, they've been called as a class of proteins, nucleomodulins. So you can look it up and you can find information on nucleomodulins. Thank you. We have a second question. Could we use epigenetic drugs to target some pathogens? Yeah, I can maybe speak to that. I think that's actually been done um, um, currently um, in HIV research, um, I think in, in, in two ways. I, I have in, introduced to you the concept that we want to force the, the pathogen into silence. 
um, and um, and and the other the other one is um, that you actually reactivate the virus um, in order for the immune system to see it and to destroy the cell that are um, that are uh, uh, latently infected. And for this, we have been using epigenetic drugs like HDAC inhibitors. They have been shown. They have been used in in clinical trials. Um, they um, <clears throat> they work, but not very potently. Um, and I think, um, and, and and I think now we're looking into many different either combinations of different drugs or, um, or you know, more specific uh, ways to interfere with the virus epigenetic uh, regulation versus you know the rest of the genome's epigenetic regulation. But yes, um, epigenetic drugs have been used um, so far experimentally and and clinically. Uh, many preclinically uh, are in testing. Uh, but uh, but the idea is that uh, that we're learning from the cancer field and um, and and applying what has been done there um, to pathogens um, and, and and seeing how it works. I can add to that because for bacteria it has not been used yet. Uh, however, we do know that if we inhibit the epigenetic epigenetic mechanisms that bacteria uh, exploit during infection, that we have that we can uh, stop or block infection. And so the idea is to find these drugs that would then be able to target these mechanisms. So it's still being researched in the lab, uh, but it is a, a option. And this is why we're spending so much time researching it. But, it, but a very common question that comes out of this is like, if we are messing with this very intricate layer of regulation with the drug, is that not going to mess up the whole, the whole body and the whole cell? Is it, in other words, making us more sick than it makes us more healthy? Um, now, this is a very interesting question. Um, and I think it comes down to um, to the, the fact that if we could take the example of cancer, some, some cancers really make some genes go up very, very, very strongly. They become really hyperactive. And, um, and if you hit them with an epigenetic drug, these genes that are hyperactive are being hit first. Um, and the others are, are less susceptible, especially if you play with the doses. And the same is the hope for the, uh, for the pathogen, because the pathogen is now hyperactivating or manipulating or hijacking um, one specific mechanism that is very, very hyped up and, and very active. If you now hit it with a drug, you, the, the idea is that this, this layer is first hit uh, before the others are, uh, you know, um, dramatically changed. Um, and so this is the this is the balance that we have with all treatments that we have that we have to make sure that there's a good um, on target off target relationship here or ratio here, but uh, but I think there's there's good good evidence that um, that you can use an epigenetic drug that is very general um, and have very specific effects on 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 certain genes or on the pathogen. Um, another question is, can one imagine that people carrying certain neutral or good viruses have epigenetic change that protect them against other infectious, infectious agents? Well, that goes into the memories uh, field there. So Melanie, you might have, uh, have an opinion on that. Yes. Uh, so it is uh, very much possible that that, that is the case. Um, I don't think there is any evidence to show that that uh, that this is the case. And so we are currently trying to see if a cell that has previously been infected, that has acquired epigenetic changes, will then uh, transmit that information and therefore upon a secondary infection will respond differently. So that's kind of the same idea of is there um, neutral or bacteria that or, or viruses that don't modify actively, that don't cause any symptoms that could change the epigenetics, and then whether that would uh, lead to a different response. And so um, it's completely possible, and I think that there's a lot coming out of the, uh, uh, a lot of research coming out of the uh, microbiome field, where in fact uh, having different populations of bacteria in your gut will predispose you or not to different uh, immune responses. And that could be uh, through an epigenetic mechanism 
but I think that, that it's too, too early to say whether this is actually the case. Yeah, it's very interesting because the microbiome, um, the bacteria sometimes secrete certain metabolites that are that are manipulating the machinery, the epigenetic machinery, and um, and that is really fascinating because it really shows us um, that there's a different layer of how we can manipulate it, it, it which is just with you know the metabolic byproducts of, mm -hmm. of of certain reactions that will then feed into the uh, if a gene is turned on and off, and so the microbiome connection is really a very um, a very cool example how. Um, how the epigenetic, um, how good microbiome might might affect, you know, your immune system potentially, or your or your gut, or your other epithelial layers that you have in your body, um, in order to become uh, more protected or more more healthy. We we also trying in the virology world to to exploit, um, you know, using, you know, certain let's say mini viruses. Um, against you know using depriving them of their of their resources and in in, in, in in using the real virus so when the real virus comes in it doesn't have any more the landscape and the resources to um to to replicate itself so there are there are ways to try through to trying to to generate these good viruses in order to be protective they're not specifically interfering with the epigenetics they're more sort of you know depriving the um the the real virus of all the resources that it has in the cell but but one can imagine that this could also be you know constructed such that uh, that it would be specifically um modifying the epigenetic landscape so yeah there's there's many ideas going into that direction um and um and many things that are that are coming out and that could be potentially in the future being used therapeutically which is super exciting if I can just add something, I think the difficulty here is to really show cause and effect versus just correlation. And so I think for now, most of the studies have shown that there's a, a good correlation between maybe good bacteria and epigenetic changes, but whether these are actually the root or the cause of the protection is going to be more difficult to, uh, to prove in the future. Mm. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, I think we have another question. Can we use CRISPR technology to target epigenetic modification to a specific location of a gene? And if that possible, can uh, we can target specific modification that then global? Can we do that? Definitely, yes. That's a very, um, that is, um, you know, just being done. I think, um, you know, you have two, two possibilities. The CRISPR technology is really one way you can really go after the sequence uh, if you use it um, in its natural form. But, but because it is so targeted, um, you can also make a fusion uh, out of the CRISPR enzyme, which is not going to be active in editing the, the genome directly, but it's just going to recruit other um, 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 enzymes or other, um, you know, cargo to a certain to a certain gene, a pathogen or you know, or a cellular gene that you want to turn on and off. And then you can, you know, you can put an activator or a repressor on this gene um, on a, a, together with the CRISPR, with a dead CRISPR enzyme um, and um, and modify this locus to turn it on and off simply by, by changing the epigenetic um, environment. And I think this is a, a very exciting um, possibility um, that we currently exploiting and um, or exploring in, in synergy with epigenetic drugs in order to really go after selective, um, you know, integrated viruses, um, especially mm -hmm. HIV, um, to turn it off um, or to turn it on. Mm -hmm. I don't have much to add because, uh, that, yes, I yeah. agree with everything that was said. <laughs> Great. Um, so the last question now. Is there a similarity in epigenetics that in case of an infection compared to change in other, in other disease like cancer or egging? Uh, do you collaborate with researchers from other fields? So yes, uh, I think that there, there are many parallels that can be drawn, uh, especially the, the main field in which epigenetics is, is the root or is, is really being studied is cancer. And in the cancer field, uh, um, there, there are many changes that uh, are, are well defined and that we can then look at uh, in, in our different uh, pathogens. 
Specifically, for instance, for bacteria, we know that uh, certain bacteria uh, want to maintain the uh, survival of the host cell and so will induce similar mechanisms as what's do, used during cancer or um, will have to deal with um, DNA damage or, or genotoxic stress in similar manners that, that cancerous cells would. So yes, uh, the mechanisms, there are parallels to be drawn and we do uh, uh, definitely read that literature and are inspired by, by those, um, those findings. And uh, at least on my end, we have some cancer biologists that's just down the, the, the hallway that we can uh, go ask for tools and, and suggestions. So yes, we, we do uh, collaborate on that, uh, on that end. I can say one word about aging. That's really interesting because uh, we have been working in the past on a group of enzymes, um, so those epigenetic modifying enzymes that we explained to you in the past um, that are very important for aging. It turns out that these uh, enzymes are, um, you know, preventing aging. And when they go down in their in their activity, that that sort of correlates with um, with aging, um, and and people have ma manipulated that machinery in mice and in in rodents, and have shown that there is causal interactions. Now it turns out that uh, that HIV um, hijacks one of these aging uh, pro age no anti aging enzymes and turns it off, um, and so um, sort of somehow directly interlinking itself with the aging machinery, um, and 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 sort of accelerating or inducing sort of an, a more accelerated stage stage of, uh, stage of aging, at least in the infected cell. And we're very interested to show uh, to to see whether that has any effect on the on the general aging process, uh, because we know that HIV is infecting um, T cells, CD4 positive T cells, also some macrophages and potentially, um, you know, other um, immune cells that are CD4 positive. But I think the the idea is is that is that aging process in the immune system now translating to a, a sort of an org organismal aging pr process, and and the interaction between the immune system and aging is very um, is is potentially very close, and um, and uh, because because our immune system ages naturally, because we, we shut down our thymus and uh, T cells have sort of a finite uh, replication span and, and, and lifespan. Um, and so the idea is, is there a direct consequence and is the pathogen, in, in, in this case, HIV, really directly, you know, manipulating that process and potentially pushing it into an accelerated um into an accelerated gear, and um, that is that is supported by by the clinic because we know that people living with HIV and and being being on antiretrovirals and being super um, compliant and and suppressed can still have certain diseases of aging in an accelerated uh, pace, and that's the reason why we want to get rid of that virus uh, once and for all and not just be on, on antiretrovirals for, 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 for a lifespan. So I think there's very interesting emerging interactions between aging and, um, and, and pathogens and how they manipulate the immune system and how that could then potentially affect our lifespan and our health span in the future. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I think that was our last question, so we can conclude. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your experience and your expertise. Uh, I learned a lot myself, um, so thank you again. Uh, I also want to thank you, our viewers, for joining us today. Um, and yeah, th thanks again. I really appreciate uh, moderating this panel. and. Uh, I hope we will uh, see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your support. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.